look at the life of Stalin from the end of World War II to the end of his life. After the war, Stalin became the embodiment of victory and patriotism. Central and Eastern Europe fell under his army's sway. Most people saw this as communists spreading their ideology forcibly across Europe. Stalin saw other minor reasons. Russia had been invaded several times over the centuries, and these buffer states would negate the possibility. Stalin's pictures started appearing in more places across the Soviet Union. Stalin also started pushing the Russia first that would become a major part of the Soviet attitude to the end. Stalin started saying things like Russians were the outstanding nation and the leading force of the Soviet Union. While historically he was right, but Stalin himself wasn't Russian, but Georgian. In 1946 and 1947, Stalin's collected works were published by the state. The eulogies published were the greatest ever written for Stalin. Stalin also had a strengthening international position, but he was concerned with the returning veterans and people demanding change. The veterans were a very big problem in that they were looting areas outside the Soviet Union, bringing back things from market economies that were just not available in the USSR. Returning Soviet prisoners of war were routed through camps, called filtration camps, to determine the possibility of the former POWs being traitors. Over two and three quarter million people were taken to these camps. Nearly half of them were sent to labor camps. The Baltic states, which were forcibly annexed during the war, showed extreme opposition to Soviet rule. Stalin started a new program to rid Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia of their attitudes when it came to things like church and the Kuluks. This resulted in almost 150,000 deportations from those Baltic rep republics in the next four years. The Gulag program was also increased. Stalin and his NKVD, Soviet secret police, were rounding up anyone who could be considered a threat to the Soviet system, or, more to the point, to Stalin himself. The Soviet population was made to pay for this type of paranoia on behalf of Stalin and his government, and already shrinking Soviet population was further reduced, not by death, but by imprisonment and exile of nearly 3% of the country's population. The NKVD was also assigned another task from Stalin, determine the extent of damages from the war. It was determined that nearly 72,000 villages and towns were destroyed by the Great Patriotic War. The exact number of killed varied between 26 and 27 million. In addition, the number of wounded, malnourished, and orphaned were also in the millions. Due to all this, Stalin was asked by his advisors to pull back on some of the harshest of the policies. During the war, the Russian Orthodox Church had opened churches for the people. Stalin allowed these to remain open. While not a completely free society, some freedoms were allowed in academia and arts. The death penalty was abolished in 1947. It would come back in 1950. Stalin's health at this point started to deteriorate. Towards the end of 1945, Stalin took a forced two-month vacation due to heart problems. At the end of 1945, he was 67 years old. During the, this forced vacation, his paranoia ramped up exponentially. He wanted to ensure that no one would gain enough power to oust him from his position as leader of the communist world. Purges and exterminations occurred throughout the party apparatus. The leadership of the Leningrad found themselves in 1949 accused of treachery. Most were executed in 1950. The war also made pre-war problems worse, food shortages, which were on the rise due to the collectivization of the farming, were seriously on the rise. A drought had a bad harvest in 1946, made things much worse. With the government insisting on exporting food instead of sending it to places inside the USSR that needed it, people were starving by the thousands. It is estimated that between 1 and 1.5 million people died of starvation during this period. All this while Stalin focused on infrastructure and industrial projects to build the Soviet economy and military. The biggest thing Stalin had to deal with after the war was the creation of a two superpower world. After the war, the British Empire started falling through the ranks as a world power. 
This left the former allies of the United States and the Soviet Union to become the power masters of the planet. Stalin's dedication to the communist principles that put him in power didn't help any more than the West's dedication to freedom. Publicly, Stalin denounced the Western nations as aggressive, but he knew, privately, that the war was unlikely between the U.S. and USSR. His aggressiveness towards creating an atomic bomb were just extensions of that belief that the war would be unlikely. It would never hurt to prepare. Stalin himself knew that an atomic war would spell the end of the world as they knew it, and as such, it would be the weapon of last resort. Preparation and paranoia were the words of the day as Stalin increased the Soviet military from 2.9 million active troops to somewhere near 6 million by 1953. Post-war Europe was also a very different animal when it came to the way Stalin wanted to run it. Many believed that Stalin pushed puppet governments to power in those nations that would become communist after the war. Stalin wanted a strong left communist coalition government. This would bring communism parties to power across Europe gradually. It didn't take long, but Stalin would have his people's democracies in power behind what Winston Churchill would later describe as the Iron Curtain. One of the big reasons for this way to go about it was the fact that the number of Marxists in Eastern Europe had been dramatically reduced, especially with the government of Germany executing them across the nations that it had conquered. And unlike the Baltic republics, Stalin had no wish in annexing the eight nations that would fall under his influence. He was happy keeping them independent nations. The crack in this belief started in 1947 with Tito and Yugoslavia going against a Stalinist belief. Tito wanted to put together a Balkan federation, including Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Albania. Stalin did not want this. Stalin, in turn, got the other communist nations to turn their back on Tito for being an anti-Marxist Leninist. Tito also had problems with Stalin when it came to Tito's calls for Soviet aid to Greek communists in the Greek Civil War. By June 1948, Stalin had gone so far as to order several assassination attempts on Tito and even contemplated invading Yugoslavia. Stalin had wanted to demilitarize Germany after the war, one that could possibly fall under the sphere of Soviet influence. The United Kingdom and the United States were having none of that. This led to the blockade of Berlin in June 1948. Berlin was a special case, deep within the Soviet quarter of a divided Germany after World War II. Berlin was quartered as well, with several special ground transport facilities connecting the three quarters of the city under U.S., U.K., and French influence to the rest of the German nation under the same influence. Supplying West Berlin by air became very important as no ground transportation was allowed access across Soviet-controlled Germany. The blockade lasted nearly a year. Meanwhile, the Allies belief that nations of Eastern Europe would be free to choose their own government would be dashed as irregularities crept up in elections in Poland and Hungary. Czechoslovakia did have a majority government, presumably legitimate, that supported the communist ideals. Monarchies in Bulgaria and Romania were abolished. The Soviet model of collectivism, industrialization, and single party rule was implemented across Eastern Europe. Stalin's mistrust in doctors would lead him down the road to his death his health had been ever getting worse, resulting in longer and longer vacations away from Moscow. His mistrust in doctors led him to imprison one when it was suggested that Stalin retire to prolong his life. Anti-Semitism increased surrounding Stalin. A doctor plot led to the arrest of several doctors in the Kremlin. Most of those were Jewish. A trial in Czechoslovakia led to the conviction of 13 party officials, 11 of whom were Jewish. Stalin's staff found him laying on the floor in his dacha bedroom on 1 March 1953. He had suffered a stroke. His children were called to his bedside on the 2nd. Vasily was extremely drunk and insulting and as such was sent home. Stalin died on 5 March 1953. In addition to a cerebral hemorrhage, it was found that he had suffered from acute arteriosclerosis. His death was announced the next day to the public. He laid in state for three days. People celebrating Stalin's death were arrested for anti-Soviet agitation. Stalin left no line of succession, and as such, the Soviet government would be in turmoil for several weeks. After the succession of Nikita Khrushchev, 
Some policies that Stalin put in place were backed off, including a release of a large number of political prisoners. This has been part six of the life of Stalin. We hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you've learned something you didn't know before. We also hope that you will join us again as we examine another point in history. This has been Robert Knowles. And I am Richard Simpson. Thank you and good night.